Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you, all of you, for, for joining us. Thank you to the New York Studio School and to Sugarlift Gallery for co hosting this event. And thank you to all of the painter panelists for joining me in this conversation. My name is Jordan Wolfson. I'm a painter and arts educator living in Colorado and have been concerned with questions about painting and meaning for many years and am thrilled to finally have the opportunity to have this conversation with all of these fabulous painters and with all of you. We're gonna have a conversation about painting and meaning for about an hour. And then we'll have about a half an hour for Q&A. We'll be using the chat on the back end from our side to send out links to all of you. So if you have questions during the conversation, please use only the Q&A. Please try to remember to use the Q&A to send your questions in uh, for us uh, and we'll gather them during the conversation and then we'll go over and look through them uh, during the Q&A section uh, at the end. Uh, thank you. So before I go on uh, and introduce all of the panelists, I'd like to give the platform over to Kara Carmack from the New York Studio School and Hannah Foster, the director of Sugarlift Gallery to say a, a, few, uh, a few things for, for all of you. Kara, uh, did you wanna say something? Sure, yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Kara Carmack. I'm the Assistant Director of Exhibitions and Public Programs at the New York, New York Studio School. Um, I'm delighted that the school is co-presenting this panel with Sugarlift Gallery to give space to this timely conversation on painting and meaning. Um, I know we have folks joining us from all around the world, so welcome. And I want to express a sincere thanks to you, Jordan, for all the work you've done in convening this wonderful group of artists. Um, I just want to say a little bit about the school. There might be some folks who aren't familiar with us. We were founded in 1964 as an intensive studio arts program with an emphasis on perception. We've remained true to our founders vision, uh, a faith in the great language of art, a commitment to excellence, integrity, and serious work habits, the encouragement of an open mind, and conviction in the power of art to change one's life. And to learn more about the school and our programs, please visit us online. We offer full-time MFA certificate and virtual certificate programs, as well as part-time options that include marathons, evening and weekend classes, and drawing and sculpture master classes. And before I go, finally, since Ruth Miller is here with us tonight, I want to encourage everyone who's in New York or nearby or planning to come visit um, before October 22nd to please come to the school and see our current exhibition, Ruth Miller's Enduring View, which you have a sneak peek of here behind me. So thank you all and I look forward to this conversation. Thank you, Kara. Uh, Hannah, would you like to say something? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kara. That was, that was a great intro. Jordan, thank you so much for putting all of this together. Thank you to all of the panelists. Um, as Jordan mentioned, I'm a director at Sugarlift. I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Kate Keery, who's a curator at Sugarlift and some of our other team members who are watching. I've had the incredible privilege of uh, getting to spend time with a lot of the artists' work. Uh, the artists here on this panelist have had work in our gallery and some of our exhibitions. And it's been such a privilege to get to, um, you know, really spend time with the paintings and really unpack some of those layers of meaning that I hope we'll get into. Um, I hope not everybody on this panel agrees about what meaning in painting is. I hope we have a lively debate. That'd be better if, if some people disagreed. Um, but, you know, I... I was thinking about that question, you know, meaning in painting and, and where does it lie? And unlike what Kara does, you know, with, with the New York Studio School and what all of you incredible painters do um, in kind of dealing with that question of meaning on the front end of an art object's life in the application of paint to canvas in rendering forms on that canvas, what we do as a gallery is kind of dealing with that question of meaning on at a later stage in that object's life and thinking about how we communicate that meaning to hopefully a collector who understands it enough to want to live with the piece, 
to purchase it, to have it in their home, to let that meaning unfold over time. Um, so, you know, I really feel that that our task as a gallery, maybe similarly to the task of a painter, is one of translation, translating that meaning to others, helping communicate it, helping facilitate that, um, that uh, transition from artist's hand to canvas to collector. So I'm excited to hear about what that translation means uh, for the artists when it comes to uh, perception and, and putting it into paint. Great. Wonderful, thank you. So thank you uh, everybody. And uh, I'd like to briefly introduce uh, everyone on the panel before we, uh, before I introduce a, a bit more about the topic and we move into it. Uh, Ruth Miller, uh, born in 1930, a painter of still life and landscape, lives and works in Washington Depot, Connecticut. Although working occasionally from memory, the artist paints mostly from observation. For her, no two cabbages, no two pictures are alike. Each object has its unique and formal presence with attention paid to the way forms press against each other and shape the space around them. Miller studied at the University of Missouri and the Art Students League in New York City, but it was within the charged atmosphere of 10th Street in New York City in the 50s that Miller formed her lasting commitment to painting. Miller is a member of the National Academy, Academy of Design and has most recently shown at John Davis Gallery, Lowen Gedould Gallery and the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Ruth currently has a show up at the New York Studio School, as you've heard, running until October 22nd with an in-person panel discussion on her work at the Studio School on October 10th. John Lees, born in 1943 in Denville, New Jersey, received his BFA and MFA from the Otis Art Institute in Los Angeles, California. He has been exhibiting in New York since 1977 and has been an instructor at the New York Studio School since 1988. He lives and works in upstate New York. Lees is the recipient of numerous awards and grants, including the American Academy of Arts and Letters Hassam, Speicher, Betts, and Simmons Purchase Fund Award, the Francis J. Greenberger Award, and the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Grant, and the National Endowment of the Arts Fellowship Grant. His work can be found in a host of public institutions, most notably the Detroit Institute of Art, the Fogg Art Museum in Cambridge, Massachusetts, the Kemper Collection in Kansas City, Missouri, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, and the New Museum in New York City. John currently has a show up at the Betty Cunningham Gallery in New York City running until October 28th. Ying Li is an American painter and arts educator born in Beijing, China and immigrated to the United States in 1983. She is the Felissa Koshland Professor of Fine Arts at Haverford College. She received her BFA at the Anhui Normal University in China in 1977 and her MFA at Parsons School of Design in 1987. Lee's work is represented by Pamela Salisbury Gallery in Hudson, New York, Gross McLeaf Gallery in Philadelphia, Alice Galvin Gallery in Portland, Maine and Valley House Gallery and Sculpture Garden in Dallas, Texas. Lee has won the Edwin Palmer Memorial Prize and Henry Ward Ranger Fund Purchase Award, both from the National Academy in New York City. Lee's work has been reviewed in the New York Times, the New Yorker, Art Forum, Art in America, New York Sun, the Philadelphia Inquirer, Hyperallergic Art Critical, and the Washington Post, among others. Ying has two solo shows coming up, one at the New Art Dealers Alliance in New York City, organized by Alice Galvin Gallery, opening January 5th and running until Feb February 2nd. And one at the Eleanor Wilson Museum at Hollins University, opening on February 1st and running until April 14th. Eric Elliott completed his MFA in painting and drawing at the University of Washington in Seattle and his undergraduate work in painting at the University of California, Berkeley. He took part in a year long artist residency at the Jerusalem Studio School in Israel in 2014. He was the 2009 recipient of the Benke Foundation's Neti Artist Fellowship. 
was in the 2009 Northwest Biennial at the Tacoma Art Museum and received the Seattle Art Museum's Kayla Skinner Special Recognition Award. Eric Elliott currently lives in Colorado where he works as an associate professor of painting and drawing and is the art and design department head at Colorado Mesa University. Clintel Steed, born in 1977 in Salt Lake City, Utah, received his BFA from the School of Art Institute of Chicago and his MFA from Indiana University and completed advanced studies at the New York Studio School of Drawing, Painting and Sculpture. His work has been featured in numerous solo and group exhibitions, most recently Clintel Steed and Dimian at Stephen Harvey Fine Arts Project in New York City. Emoji Show at Klaus van Nichtschagend, New York, and So Much So Little All at Once at Regina Rex, New York City, among others. He is the recipient of the John Koch Award from the National Academy of Arts and Letters, and recent press includes Hyperallergic, Art Critical, and the New York Sun. Steed lives and works in New York City. Zoe Frank, born in 1987 in Boulder, Colorado, makes use of patterns and elements of abstraction in her large scale multi-figure compositions. Her work draws on a wide range of approaches to pictorial space from across art history. Frank studied for four years with Juliet Aristides in the Classical Atelier at Gage Academy of Art in Seattle before receiving her MFA in painting from Laguna College of Art and Design in California. She has received numerous awards and honors, including three Elizabeth Greenshields grants, the Avigdor Arija Memorial International Residency Scholarship, and three first place awards in Manifest Gallery's International Painting Annual. Her work has been featured recently in New American Paintings, High Fructose Magazine, Fine Art, Fine Art Connoisseur, Artists and Illustrators, and American Art Collector among many others. In 2023, she served as a juror for the Bennett Prize and for the Figurativas Award at the MEAM Museum in Barcelona. She is represented by Sugarleaf Gallery in New York and Gallery Mocum in Amsterdam. Mm. Some years ago, I was reading an article, I think it was an art, art in America, or maybe it was Art Forum, about art education in this country. I remember Howard Sigerman was one of the contributors, currently chair of the Department of Art and Art History at Hunter College. At the time, I believe he was in Virginia. And he was talking about a split in our art education, that there were the programs for skill development that gave students the ability to technically make stuff well and have formal ease with the materials. And you could get that kind of education at the state universities and community colleges. Skills like how to draw realistically, that sort of thing. And then there was a more art world directed education, learning how to think and talk about art in a more conceptually and culturally sophisticated way. And for this, a student needed to go to a more elite and expensive school like Yale or RISD or Columbia. But one wouldn't necessarily learn formal skills there. They expected you would be able to take care of that yourself. And the more local colleges weren't investing in future art stars with a lot of art theory courses. This was a description of a split in our art education between the making and the meaning, which makes sense because our educational institutions are functioning within the larger culture. And our larger culture suffers from an ongoing split that goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, mind and body, making and meaning, thinking and feeling. And generally speaking, 
meaning in our world is assumed to be conceptually based. But for painters, living our lives through the wielding, the picking up and putting down of paint, meaning is a felt experience and one grounded in making. This was one of the great and exhilarating adventures of modernity. And it has to do with being an embodied human. And this is also one of the great and valuable things about places like the New York Studio School where meaning is still found and grounded in the making. And it's also one of the valuable things about places like the Sugarlift Gallery that has a clear intention of helping painters do exactly that, make a living so they can make their work. So I wanted to have a conversation today about all of that with other painters who all paint in quite different ways, all representational for the sake of this conversation, but all finding their own unique ways of putting a painting together and finding their own paths of meaning. And I wanted to bring this conversation to people, all of you, folks who not only care about painting, but also folks who are learning to paint, to strengthen those ambitions and deeper possibilities for felt meaning. In preparation for this conversation, I asked each of the panelists to mull over a few short questions in relation to their painting practice. And then we gathered those thoughts together or somewhere uh, we had a few, uh, uh, few other things like a, a link to a song, we had a poem, we had all kinds of wonderful responses. And then we sent that back out to all of us so that we could get a sense of where we were all coming from. So we're gonna start with uh, each of the panelists uh, speaking uh, out of their own experience, their, you know, their sense of, of painting and meaning. And then we're gonna open it up for all of us uh, on the panel to ask questions of each other and open it just to, 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 a, to a, a, a conversation together. And, uh, and then after we, we go through that, please feel free during that to send your questions into the Q&A. And then we will uh, look and start going through those and, uh, and field that afterwards. So we'll start. Um, one one last thing I'd like I, I would like to mention before um, getting into it is uh, that one of the things that was important to me in in gathering uh, all of these wonderful painters together is that we've got at least three generations here, <clears throat> and uh, that's a, that. There is something about a lineage. There's something about a story, uh, a larger project, and. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that we have the, the, the span that we have. And uh, I'd like to start with, with Ruth. Uh, if you could uh, perhaps uh, say a few words, what you think, uh, what comes to mind when you are thinking about painting and meaning. All right, Jordan, I will start with pretty much what I sent to you that I find meaning in the making of my work, creating it, bringing meaning and paint into actual, actual life, to a parallel to actual life. That may sound vague. What do you mean by actual life, a parallel to actual life? Well, I feel that, that you know, you're working on a two-dimensional surface and that I, I want to have the work stand up to actual life, but it's different. And that's what I mean by that. And then I paint the things, the objects and trees and the fruits, the vegetables that I love looking at and that I have around me and that I become familiar with. And, and uh, as I look and work on them, I hope that a, well, a dialogue opens up and that takes me further and deeper into the work. 
And I find the longer I work on a painting and the closer I get to a clear and, and, a, and to a true realization of what I am looking at. And it's more about even seeing. It's about seeing. And the way I use paint is I think inseparable from the meaning. Oh, that's my desire. I don't know if I'll ever achieve that, um, but that is what I hope most for. So, okay. yeah. thank you. So we'll, we'll come back to that. I'd like to, we're gonna take time. Uh, I'd like to go through everyone, but I mean, I have lots of thoughts that I wanted to ask you, but I'll, I'm gonna hold off on that. And um, okay. uh, John, would you mm. uh, care to say something? Okay, I, I haven't, um, I, I, I didn't plan anything. Um, I, did, I wanted to uh, speak kind of um, spontaneously. Um, I, I, I think maybe one of the things, the thing I did think about a lot, or, or I think about all the time, is that uh, it's very hard for me to separate my life from, from my artwork. Uh, I, 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 I include the practice of drawing and I started doing this probably around the age of seven and, and my family moved around the country a lot and I was, um, um, well, I'm an only child. I'll try not to start every sentence with the word I, but it's not very easy. <laughs> But so I was, I was by myself a lot for a long time, you know, I'd come and be a kind of a new kid in school like that. So I kind of um, got in the habit of doing things in my room a lot. And um, it, it seemed to always, no matter what it was, it always came down to drawing and painting in different ways, watercolor, poster paint, I started with oils a little later and and um so it, it's it's just become this activity that that i i do in my room all the time jake bertho said that i'm a high school bedroom painter <laughs> now, now some people said don't ever let anybody hear you say that <laughs> um but that's sort of the the, the way it is and I think the other thing that, that I wanted to, to, to talk about just very briefly is why I spend so much time on paintings, on individual paintings. Um, I think about it, it, about if you look at periods of your life, either as a human or as an artist, you might go and think, I wish I hadn't done that. I wish I hadn't behaved that way. I, I wish I had been different. And I think that the same with, with my paintings. There were certain themes that were very important to me. And I just didn't get them right. They were too important to abandon. I mean, I thought three years was working a long time. And, you know, I always thought of Jay DeFeo working for seven years on The Rose. I mean, that, she was kind of like an idol of mine in that way. And um, I just, re I, it took me longer than seven years. I mean, I have paintings, you know, that, that you know, like one, you know, 20 years. I have one painting I finished that took me 40 years. I mean, it's, it's that. I need to do it better. I need to do it better. You know, that wasn't good enough for the, the paintings I was making about Otis Art Institute, which I don't call that anymore. I call them courtyards. But, but um, I went through a period in the 80s when I was think I was in my 40s when I, where I started listening to music that, that, that I was on. Uh, nostalgia rock radio, which was not music I listened to. I listened more to jazz, but I started hearing things 
from the 60s, from the time that I was in art school. And I literally got this cold rush up my spine. And I only wanted to reduplicate that, I wanted to duplicate that feeling. So I started with these themes. And it turned out it took me 20 years, 30 years to finish them. It was no, I paint fast. I, I, I'm i not a, a realist painter. I don't, like I heard once John Moore was talking to about, you know, he said that he had, oh, a well, great day today if I painted four bricks. You know, I don't paint like that. I paint like this. I mean, the, the one, the the painter that was the most important to me with, that just set my whole course was Georges Rouault, who was not spoken of much these days at all. But I just knew when I, I saw his work and then later other people too, Red Grooms, German Expressionism, Milton Resnick, certainly Frank Auerbach, um, influenced me a lot. I mean, I can't even begin to say how many. And um, where was I? Where am I? I'm 80 years old, you know. I, I It's my immaturity. People don't think that I'm really 80 years old, but I am. And so I paint fast, but over long periods on a given on a given painting, over very long periods. And I have them out and they they tell me, you know, you can work on this. You might be able to finish this for this show. Well, I could just keep talking. Okay. Well, thank you. you. Know, like, like, that was um, wonderful. You know, it, it, and Joe, okay, I, I'm going to stop. <laughs> we'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ying. I, I just wanted to follow what John said. You know, it's a, the meaning is so much to do with the personal experience and also, you know, has different meaning in different time in my life. Uh, you know, you think about basically, you know, we all, we all paint, you know, we all, put paint on this 2D surface. You know, to me, that is uh, so complicated. And uh, that's that's the meaning why we're doing this. You know, they sort of like enough, you know, just to, to get going. And in the personal level, you know, I, uh, I was born in China and uh, had my early education uh, under communist regime. And uh, so I was taught, I was, you know, taught and told uh, the meaning of mark, uh, the meaning of art is really serve the revolution. You know, it's, uh, it's all about power you know, political. Right. And so when I, you know, when I got a chance to come here, the first thing I want to get rid of is that part. And uh, so, you know, I would do anything in my work not to go there. You know, that's, a, that's sort of my determination. Mm. And uh, as, you know, as I grew older and uh, I started to look back and to see things, you know, see the connection and to see how things interact. And, uh, you know, the meaning of painting really changed. I think it's a very specific a part uh, in everybody's life is the pandemic, you know, the past, few years what we went through and as a painter I had a like incredibly blessing time to just paint and uh, I was locked down at Haverford you know we we stayed on the beautiful beautiful Haverford campus and uh, nobody around but uh, you know, fox, deers, rabbits, and uh, they all came out. 
and the nature is just uh, like uh, it's 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 just incredible. It's like a burst of energy without uh, humans interference. And so I, you know, I just painted. I dragged my stuff here and there, and I got to paint some bigger canvas, uh, which I couldn't do uh, before. Uh, and uh, I never thought about the meaning of it. You know, it's just like, it's really like a live in the moment and uh, just paint, you know, just paint, just paint. You know, that's, you know, that's what we do. You know, we're painters. And uh, I even didn't think about, you know, good or bad. It's really about the, the, this urgency to be connected. And, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's really, you know, another uh, layer of, you know, meaning. Great. Thank you. Clintel? Um, I'm going chronological, sorry. Eric, I think you're older than Clintel. <laughs> then I will go next. Um, okay. All right. Um, Thanks for not giving us heads up what we were going to talk about this. Uh, um, <laughs> no, I, uh, for me, the meaning, um, I think as, as Ying was saying, it's evolved over time. Um, it's basically, for me, some a dialogue with something larger, with something inside myself. So for me, it's like nothing really matters, but getting closer to that feeling that I get through the painting. And so um, it, it's all kind of a game of warm and cold of trying this direction or trying this out or doing this thing um, and, and feeling whether it's actually getting that feeling I want or the response I want or, um, I don't know. And it's one of those things that you don't necessarily know until you see it. You just have to make the painting put the paint down and respond to it. And so like, like what John was saying, you just look at it and it needs to be better. So you keep working on it or you uh, get an idea on how to do it better. And you either keep painting on that painting for 40 years or you set it aside and start another one um, doing the different idea. So, so for me, sometimes I'll get that idea on a, on a different um, direction to chase. So instead of doing it in that painting and seeing if maybe that's the way or the other way is the way I'll just start the exact same still life in a different way. So often I have uh, different iterations of the same still life. Um, I think I did 25 paintings of one cup because I just couldn't stop thinking of different ways to try and paint the cup. And it was also fun to see like one painting next to another that you thought were so different. And then once they were next to each other, they looked the same. Um, so you're like, okay, that didn't do anything. Or you'd start in a totally different way thinking it was gonna change something and it would be exactly the same, um, you know, to by the end. So, it, it, you know, really getting to know the process and, and all of that, but it's, yeah, it's this chase um, trying to really find the, the, the presence, the life, the, I don't know what it is in the painting. You're trying to bring it to life. You're trying to, um, yeah, I don't, it's, I mean, we've all, we all know what, what I'm trying to say in terms of that. It's, you know, it's like, what is that? The, the golem take the mud and make the, the, the person come alive. You're trying to make the mud and, and, uh, bring the, put the painting and make it come to life. I mean, it's, you know, it's all just energy and I don't know. It's like, anyway, it's, it's hard to put exactly in the meeting, but I, I think I'm getting as close as I'm going to get. <laughs> okay. Great. Thank you. Clintel? Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, I think I, I just want to say, you know, sometimes when you try to put things that are sacred into mm -hmm. words, um, I think about Philip Guston. Mm -hmm. You can't really describe it. And once you try to describe it, it might, you know, actually evade you. Um, but I think there's something inert uh, in all of us. And I think this does go back to the caveman. Um, I think it goes back to some of my teachers. Um, and, and it goes back to my life. 
being transformed and 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 I, by this experience um, to want to to create, to make, um, to use your hands to translate. Um, so, and I think all of us here. I was thinking about this moment. One of the things that I think you know, I was thinking about certain things. Things fall out of flavor, you know, things. But I think this moment tells of that power of that we still need to create, we still need to see, we still need to record. Um, and so, and we don't, you know, like I said, I go all the way back to the beginning of time, um, back to the caveman, I, I, as we're, everybody's talking, I imagine that caveman or woman for the very first time, dipping their hand in mud or whatever it was and recording themselves recording their experience. And I just want to say this. So I know that many things, I think I'm a part of a tradition um, and I'm honored to be here in this phone call with these people. You, Jordan, I don't know if people have saw Jordan. I think if you see Jordan on Instagram painting, that could probably say enough of what the experience of painting is. I mean, I didn't know Jordan. I didn't know I would end up in this conversation with Jordan, but I've seen Jordan numerous times painting. And I tell you guys, wow, that is what it's about. And I don't know if many words could ever describe that experience. Amen. Zoe? Let's see, I think, um... I guess I, I'm uh, like all of these other other painters. I think I'm finding the meaning in the making of the painting primarily, um, and I'm painting um, kind of the things that are around me. Like Ruth was saying, things that I, my family and friends, and the objects that I'm encountering every day. Um, here's my parents at the kitchen table, um, and um, I, I think that there's something that feels really kind of um, important about giving that kind of care and attention to these really mundane everyday moments. Um, so the, so the, the meaning feels like there's a little bit of it there, um, but in a way that, that actually feels secondary to the kind of formal aspects of actually just being in the painting and making the painting um, and choosing these more kind of simple everyday things that I'm familiar with uh, allows them to be less kind of, you know, charged with 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 so you know since they're not carrying so much meaning i'm able to kind of focus on the painting itself um so if i'm painting just a sandwich it's just a sandwich and i can really focus on like how do i how do i make this into a painting um because i'm not like saying something political or you know sophisticated through the sandwich itself you know um and i think that that um when i'm painting when i'm engaged in the painting i feel really alive and activated and it's balancing, like trying to balance the composition, trying to find shapes that create, like that hold the space, but create tension, um, trying to find color relationships that are, that vibrate and are complicated, um, playing between abstraction and representation. And, you know, in this painting, trying to have these parts that are, are really fully realized and parts that are just gesturally placed in um, kind of versions of that same, that same motif. Um, the tension between the kind of motif that I'm looking at and the historical references that I'm thinking about as I'm approaching the motif, they feel like all of these kind of um, kind of tensions that I'm that I'm like struggling with and trying to balance as I'm making a painting. And that struggle and um, pull between that kind of tightrope juggling match that I'm doing um, feels incredibly alive and engaged. Um, and as Jordan talks about, I think I'm like hoping that some of that aliveness that energy gets kind of embodied into the into the painting itself and can kind of emanate it back in some way to the viewer um but that it's that kind of engagement um of trying to make a painting that feels um really meaningful to be to be doing every day mm -hmm. um and i feel just so lucky to get to have that to do <laughs> it kind of it's like the kind of centering part of um kind of you know organizing principle of my life in a certain way so thank you wonderful it's uh wonderful hearing everyone's thoughts and feeling into it and um i <clears throat> i'd like to open it up if you have uh, questions for each other or thoughts of, in response to each other's work or the things that people sent back in and what we you know passed out 
uh, if anyone has any uh, or anything else to say, <laughs> just opening it up. Yes, Ying, you, can, you, I, like... can I open it up, Ben? Sure, please, Ruth, go ahead. Okay. This, this, I, I was thinking about what John was saying, and uh, I, I know John that you say, and I, I know that your work, your paintings take years, sometimes thirty years, and and yet to me they seem, they seem very immediate, and and they're startling present. They have such a presence, and they're there for us even though there are layers and layers of paint and of work and of time. And I think, I think they're timeless. There's something about them that is timeless, but they also are very much in time. And I want to ask, I want to ask you about this dialogue that you have through all these years the dialogue you have in paint with time, the, the past and the present, is that the meaning that you are seeking? That, I mean, that's a very, for me, when I look at your painting, that's a very, very deep and strong meaning, and it's mysterious. I, I think the question is muddled, but can you answer it, John? <laughs> Um, I mean, your relationship to time, I mean, it's there. I mean, well, I mean, I don't want to, maybe we shouldn't even talk about it because it's so mysterious and it's so important in your work. Well, I do have a special relationship with time. Um, um, I have a very curious kind of memory. I, I can't tell my memory what to do, but um, I can probably place any event of my life down to about a two month period. I mean, it's just going on and on like that. I was, I'm able to memorize, to, to, to name everybody on my junior high school photo, you know, and it goes into, I don't know, many hundreds or, I mean, I have a, a curious, uh, I feel sometimes like I have a, I'm a time hawk. I can go back into time and, and I think about the feelings about being able to do that. Um, I, I, I don't, and, and maybe, maybe somehow that these paintings take so long hooks up with that in some way, but it's not a way I'm aware of really. I mean, of course, I start thinking about these after I say it. I've, I mean, I'll, I'll be thinking about the way I answered this question. You know, I just, I just want to say I think that's what's beautiful about the experience as a painter. You know, I think John working on those pieces for thirty years, ten years, and it being that, you know, that's why you can't put painting into a box. You know, it's it's something different for all of us. And we all have to sort of find a way to that truth. Um, and when you see a person like John sitting here with us saying, wow, you know, just spending time with him as the painter, um, it's really beautiful that they reflect on this image that's on the screen and know that, oh, this portrait just didn't happen. It took 10 years of me going back again and again with whoever this person may be. Um, and John, I'm sorry, I don't mean to speak out of term, anybody, I just- I'm, I'm glad you, I'm glad you- you're I, Yes, yes. So my, that's beautifully said. Yes. Beautifully said. Yes, so, and it's a conversation, so yes. But I say something good. more, I mean, since you put sure. up the picture, yeah. I mean, yes. I, I mean, um, I'm playing out a lot of fantasies in painting like this. Now, I have a lot of, fa I, I, you know, certain with art history, you know, for a while I was painting with this a very old limited palette. Um, so I, I start thinking about older painting. I mean, I love Pompeii and the Pompeii. I'm also, you know, you can look at this. I'm a frustrated sculptor. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm clearly a frustrated sculptor. And, and um, I'm uh, playing. I think you know, like what you, you are. said, you are. Tell about the material, about mud. You know, one of the first things, relationships I had with paint is my grandfather painted. And I was given his old tubes of paint. And I remember, and I remember sitting on the floor. So I was not much more than a toddler and having this little tube of olive green, you know, paint and watching it come out of what? the tube, you know, that I think of paint as, this is a painting, by the way, that I did repaint, like on a painting like this. I wanted to get rid of the Georges Rouault that's right here that you're seeing. And I hope you can see part of my show because I've I've worked on this painting that's now called Old Mountebank. And I, I think I got rid of Georges Rouault in there. And, and um, you know, this is its state a long time ago. I mean, I have to play these things. I'm also playing out um, a fantasy that I'm a musician, that I'm playing a tenor saxophone, uh -huh. that I'm Ben Webster, that uh -huh. I play with a very full tone, a very big tone. <laughs> I'm playing all these fantasies out in painting because it seems it's the one thing I can do. It's the one thing I can focus on. I mean, like I said, I... I, I mean, I love the reason I was able to stick with it. For some reason, <laughs> I was able to stick with one thing. You yeah. know, like in that movie, A Cure yeah. Okay, Okay, I could just ramble. Yeah. On. You know, we talked about, uh, you know, stick with Penny. Actually, uh, I just wanted to tell you, you know, when I walk into your show, uh, Actually, by the way, now there are two knockout shows. Of course, there are others, but these two shows just hit me right on my heart. One is a Ruth Miller Studio School. One is John at uh, Betty. And uh, they're totally different, but they're both so full of a surprise and the mystery. You know, a, a, you know, because we're talking about the John's work. So I just wanted to say, when I walk in your, into your show, you know, each painting is totally by its own. And uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what you paint and uh, in terms of the surface, in terms of, uh, you know, the process. I remember once we talked on the phone, I called you, you said you were on the way go to the yard uh, to blast your painting with a host from water? I said, what? I thought that I heard wrong, but is it? Yeah. Yeah. I've been doing no, oh, yeah, I can go, well, well, I go to different Boston, levels Boston. of the painting. Water. Yeah, so yeah. I thought that's really, you know, the way to do it. You just, <laughs> like, you really <laughs> invent your process your way to make these paintings. You know, I I think, you know, you can put you in a certain style, you know, but each painting just has its own life, its own sort of a, you know, process of, you know, birth. And that you just like, you, you, you invent the process, you know, for each painting, you know, I thought that that's really something. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you, I'm I'm me, blown me, away tonight. Let me say this, Gunther. I want to add, but I, <laughs> I've been blown away tonight watching everybody's painting, looking at them. You know, especially thinking things like that person looks like they know what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. I you think know, I mean, all, you know, I'm, I'm really blown away with, with all these every paintings. Day. Everybody's <laughs> paintings. I've, um, I, I don't like, using the, word, I don't like so, using the word humble because I start sensing insincerity when, I mean, I've been feeling that way tonight looking at all your work. That's beautiful. But I just want to say this. I'm sorry. I think talking about Rewalt tonight is very special for me.
because I know sometimes as painters, you know, we talk about this person, we talk about that person, and there's some people like Walt who did things with material, subject matter that need to be celebrated. So thank you for that, John. Yeah. I think he's a really underrated painter. Can you even have Du Buffet without Rouault? Can no. you oh, have yeah. oh, that? Roy? Can you have Milton Resnick? I keep thinking Milton Resnick's painting what's in between the black lines in a row. Wow. Wow. You know, you I, know, mean, I didn't and, and you had Lyndon Bell, maybe Lyndon Bell. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I didn't, I got to know Ross' work from Leland. You know, he uh, yeah. he was my teacher and he's really yes. opened so many doors. Yes, and, uh, yes. He, yeah. you know, I, I, I remember, yeah. you know, yeah. I, Ying, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to just direct a little bit. You had a question for Ruth before we started. Yeah, yeah, Ruth. Because so I'd like to get to just crisscross in terms of questions for each other. Although I mean, Lord knows we could. I feel like we could just be hanging out here for hours, and I would love it. I'm just looking at you know our time with, and there's a lot of folks out there on uh, you know who have questions for us and. So what was your question that you wanted to ask Ruth okay. before we got started? My question, you know, Ruth, you used the word magic uh, talking about uh, John's work. Actually, that's how I felt when I walked into your show. And uh, when I look at those paintings, you know, there's so many uh, words and the feelings, you know, went through when I was standing in front of these paintings. And uh, you know they're so humble, but the same same time that's so majestic, and uh, they're so you know pared down, but they're so you know the precision in them, the way you know your choice of color, you cho your choice you know to let go, and uh, your choice you know the surface and the, 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 you know, the rhythm of the surface. And, you know, all those are like a, you know, mysterious. And the, I, there is a one painting particularly I remember, I remember as, you know, stood in front of it with my friend, Ron Milowitz. Uh, it's a, a very late uh, still life of a pumpkin and the shell and the, a, a teapot. And, uh, you know, I stood there, I said, it's there or it's not there. You know, it's paint and it's pumpkin. I said, how she turned the paint into pumpkin? You know, it's just like a, the, you know, the touch and the, the abstraction and the, with the, the image, you know, they all exist the same time you know i just wanted to hear a little more about you talk about you know how you make your decisions and where to go and uh, you know how you you know just like a hover between the abstraction and the image Dang. <laughs> yeah I'm here. I'm here i am absolutely stunned by by your observation, it's uh, it's very close to my own my own kind of way I find the painting of uh, you know discover what I want to do in it. I don't know how to answer that question. Um, I almost need you to repeat it again because I was listening with such delight with all that you were saying. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very difficult question to answer because when you're working and and you're involved in your work you're not thinking of of why you've chosen or how you somehow have mm. become involved with this with with these particular images can you can you uh, well, can I say something I just want can to you, say. Like, can you phrase again the uh, end of end of your? 
Uh, yeah. Can you take a second? You know, because but, I'm just, I'm so stunned by, you know, the way you handle abstraction in the image and uh, and the, your, uh, your, you know, your, your touch, your paint work. You know, maybe I shouldn't, you know, ask this because, you know, it's, it's all in the painting. Uh, you know, I just wonder if, uh, you know, you think about these and uh, of course, you know, you, or it's just instinct. You know. I, I think it's, such, it's intuitive, it's instinct, of course, and that's a very strong element in your work, as you know. I, uh, I, I feel that describing, describing the objects is not what it's about. I want to push into a much deeper or, 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 or very kind of different relationship to the work. And so, I don't know if that's a way of pushing it toward abstraction. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to eliminate a lot of things that seem to be not funny and necessary. I want to pare down the work. I want to find the basic kind of pressures and, and existence, the kind of very basic, what presence of the work is it's about presence it's about location mm, mm. and finally some of the things that anything that describes the work begins to take on a different a, a different a different meaning for me or, or a different a different language mm. at the same time i'm very interested in the identities of these objects and uh i love them I, I grow to love them as I as I work and and and, and look and funny seeing and looking becomes sort of an act of love and a connection. Okay. And so I'm not I don't want to obliterate or or to lose that. So that's I think the tension in the work, okay. and probably what I have been trying to understand or explain to myself or to push further in all my 93 years. Is that an answer? Beautiful. Beautiful. That's wonderful. Can I ask a related? Yeah, yeah. yeah, Zoe, go ahead. Oh, I was just like loving looking at the, the work from your show and especially you have these trees from the 60s and then trees from like the 90s. I was thinking about the question you were asking about time um, to John and um, kind of if the if the meaning has changed, like with kind of returning to a similar, you know, rather than working on a painting for 40 years, it seems like you've returned to some of these similar motifs um, over many decades. And if kind of the meaning has shifted as you've, you know, were you kind of pulling different meaning out of these trees um, at different times? Um, or, if it, or if there's something, there's kind of a continuity to the work um, for you. I don't know if you yes, have any thoughts about that. Yeah. Yes, the continuity, of course, but no. but I, I'm glad you asked that question because I I don't know why I somehow the pro, the meaning this is what we're talking about tonight is is that I cannot find I cannot always I want to push the work further and further and I keep I keep I keep nothing tires for me I mean I could go on working on on one motif. Or subject forever. What separates me from it is usually something in my life, like like um, having a move or having to, or well, actually, as as you can see, the fruit or the, or the objects because of their nature right. um, are transitory and they change and they and I have to replace them. And <laughs> but I I. I could go on forever unless I'm somehow removed from, from, because of life circumstances, with with these uh, with these objects and even the setup. So I may change the setup slightly. Mm -hmm. It's just a, a a small change, and that opens up a, a whole new adventure and world. Yes. And. Uh, Ruth, when you say you're pushing it further, what are you what are you pushing towards? Like that's a 
Good question, Eric. Good question. Uh, I, I know that you said something that I like very much in when I was reading your, your you know, looking through your work about, about what, something about the unconscious, about how, how your work, you kept working until something opened up and, and, and you're unconscious. I can't remember the exact wording, but it, it was wonderful. And I really, really enjoyed reading that. But I, I, um, you know, I, it's all about how long you're working on something. How, how, um, uh, as you work, how it begins to re, you know, reveal other, uh, other prop, not exactly problems, but how other. It opens up so much that needs to be addressed that you haven't seen as you begin. Well, I see that in your work. As you begin, you things as you work as you continue working, things just begin to open up and open up, and and then you address those things. And uh, I think it's uh, that's why. As obviously, as with your work, I I. I, st I can stay with the motif for a long time mm -hmm. and it's never exhausted. Mm -hmm. And um, you keep hoping it will take you deeper into some understanding of it or some mystery or some way of approaching it or getting it right, getting it right. And you just think, I, I just want to say, I, I, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't say that mystery of the mundane the metaphor, the yeah. beauty of the metaphor. You yeah. know, the face takes on the soul. You know, the, the 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 cantaloupe takes on the heart. You know, all these things. So what may seem be the gourd may seem to be something else. You know, so I love that variable. So everything is abstract in the end, right? I mean, yes, you know, yes. All abstractions. Everything is <laughs> you know? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. so but this. But see, I love the painter's mind, and thank you for showing this because one of the things I love is the ability and that want, right, to go back again, look at it again, reinvestigate again, relook, re just don't take anything for granted. Big or the small, right? Whether it be a tree or a cantaloupe, I love that. Thank you for that. Thank you, Clinton. Um, I'm, 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 I'm what? Well, one sec. Um. Oh, it feels like we've just uh, opened up this possibility and we could just keep going and going. And I'm- You know, can I say something? Mean? I just wanted to follow, in, uh, follow, uh, follow uh, what Kuntel uh, said. Kuntel okay. was said, everything is abstraction. Yeah, yes. I totally agree. But at the same time, that's, that's just not enough, you know, because you see Ruth Penning, also you see John Spen, you see everybody here, you know, they're very, very, you know, specifically rooted. Hold on a second. In, yes, yes, yes. In, I just want to say one thing. I, I just did not say at, abstract though. I said there was the power also. So you have abstraction, you have mundane, and you also have the physical object, which becomes a metaphor for something else. So it's yeah. four tier five tier it gets into this we could talk about all kind of things so i that's why i say don't put a name to anything yeah what we feel yeah. is an experience the, the, and the roof paintings we feel abstraction but for me i also feel a heartbeat you know and really? something else a yeah. body laying on to another body a, a body holding something so i may see a cup with an apple but that cup and apple is something else. It's a metaphor. So, yes. uh, so I, just, I never want to get lost in words, guys. Absolutely. True, true. true. <laughs> and that's the problem of having a conversation. We are yeah. supposed to end <laughs> at, in, in huh? about 20 minutes. Oh, good. Uh, Can we go have some dip some? <laughs> I would love to join you. I would love to join you. <laughs> um, before we open it up to hear what some of the questions from the uh, people who are viewing uh, might have for us, uh, 
does anyone have any anything they might want to ask uh, uh, about uh, uh, Clintel's process, Zoe's process, Eric's process, uh, Ying? I don't know if you sp spoke much about your pro. I mean, any. I see all these things I've seen today as music. This is visual. Hallelujah. Yeah. yeah. That's the way I look at these things to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like when I go see a painting, I my nose yeah. is practically on it. It's like the touch, like somebody, a musician has a tone, we have a touch, you know, and it, it's physical presence, you know, yes. just the, of the yes. music, the visual music. Absolutely. You know? Yes. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> you know, John, we talk about music. Uh, Conrad has a question for you. My boyfriend, uh, jazz trombonist. You remember him? Do I remember him? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm just concerned about the logistics, unfortunately. So I'm gonna. Does anyone have any questions for for Zoe or for Eric or for Clintel right now? I mean, I, their process. I, 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 I mean, my my question would be like most of us find meaning in the making, and so like getting back to the word of making, like how often? I mean, when we look at each other's work, they look so much ours, like they look like that individual person. But I know that each of us are are reinventing ourselves so many times in the paintings, and so I think about somebody with John who keeps working on something, trying to get rid of Ruwalt in the painting. How how is he? Um, <clears throat> reinventing the process to try and get rid of that and then so I look at somebody like Zoe who is pushing the abstractions and the forms and how much is it is that um in the making itself of changing the practice or you know or are you doing it in the do you find your way and make it or or is it a constant kind of evolution of the process of the making itself if, if that question makes sense oh with me oh with me it would be like if say with Ruo, it's go, banishing a color banishing a dark, the dark. Go, go. <laughs> Don't darken my journey anymore. I'm not. If there's any dark lines surrounding something, I'm going to make it dioxin purple. I'm going to put it here. It, everything I do is, yes, it has to do with that. <laughs> Actually, I have a question uh, for Zoe. You know, I'm looking at your paintings just uh, back and forth. You know, I see the. Uh, the grid and uh, the collage elements to it. And uh, those, I just wonder, you know, how you start, you start with the grid and uh, then you work into it. And uh, then the grid is a really big part of the structure or you sort of, uh, you know, let go, you know, I've just like mm -hmm. to hear, more about it because i'm all, always i'm kind of curious about you know people using grid uh you know i just i i like i like to know more about it you know how that you know become a part of the process i think um maybe i'll try and combine eric's question and yours <laughs> let's see if i can do that but um, I guess that there, I have like kind of a different process with a lot of the different paintings. I'm like trying to figure out how to how to make a painting work. And I keep trying, trying one thing and then like feeling like, oh, maybe there's like a piece of that that kind of worked. And like then that kind of leads into the next painting and that's sort of taking me from painting to painting. Um, so um, I don't know if we could look at those images again, but um, uh, so so the grids, I guess I'm also I'm thinking about this kind of um, thinking about that kind of surface of the painting and wanting, like I was talking about those kind of tensions in painting at the beginning. Um, and I think there's this kind of tension between the, the surface of the, you know, the kind of flat canvas, the physical object and the, the kind of those grids are like these little um, kind of color swatches kind of help bring me, bring my attention right to the surface of the painting. And then I'm also really wanting to play with the kind of depth of the space um, and kind of push and pull between those two. Um, so I'm not ever starting with a grid, um, but I think grids kind of show up, I guess, as this um, way of kind of coming back to the surface of the painting, I think, um, mm. a way of kind of cueing myself to that, maybe. Mm. Um, 
that big grapevine was done on a bunch of different panels and kind of it grew like a, I was like a, it's in our garden. And so, you know, one painting led, to, one panel led to the next. Um, and so I have a grid of, it ended up being on 15 different panels, but I just started on one just standing out in the yard painting and, and then let it kind of um, grow into this larger, larger composition. Mm. Um, Very cool. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I feel like we just could just keep going on and on. I, I feel uh, a, a lot of uh, amb ambivalence about shifting. I want to just hang out and talk. Um, yeah, yeah. Throw in some uh, random questions from the audience. Yeah, I suppose so. Here we go. Uh, Mark, do you have access to, uh, have you been looking through the Q&A? Are there- Yeah, uh, I have. And by the way, um, this is fantastic. I'm sure everybody agrees with me. So a basic question. There have been many questions around this idea. Uh, so I'll try to paraphrase them all together. The question is, how then does the meaning translate from your uh, experience, your intended meaning, any of that kind of stuff, then out into the audience? Out, you know, Once it's outside of you, how do you think about that? I can answer in the sense that I, I often, because I paint fairly realistically a lot of the time, I, I'll have a show and somebody will talk about how it's so representational of the thing. And then I'm like, okay, you're not getting it at all. So then I need to go back to the drawing board and, and change the painting up because of, of, of that. Um, but yeah, somebody else. So wants if to you feel like it's too, it's too depictive, you feel like you're, it's not working. Yeah, in the sense that I'm I'm not like like Ruth said, it's not about the description so much. There it's about something else. And so when when I feel like people are overly picking up on the description, then I need to to change it up. So yeah. And and what what is that what is that other thing? Or how do you explain that other thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I think it's like this. I, I could not Clintel? did you want to say Clintel? No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Ruth. Well, I just Ruth? felt I was going to say that I felt like it was like Van Gogh's cypress trees. Mm -hmm. Van Gogh would have never knew that his cypress trees would have ended up in the Met in 2023. You know, he never knew. But out of his love for the craft, out of his love for seeing, out of his love for being, he painted those trees for who? For me. Uh -huh. yeah. Why? I can That's be right. changed by his vision. Yes. So we don't know. Who knows? Who is the owner of time? Nobody. But if I can put my truth and put my truth in paint, as Ruth has done, and other people around me, that's all we're doing, right? That's the truth. Sorry. Van Gogh, <laughs> Cypress Trees. I, I, we're never going to know. I, I we're say, never going to know. We're never going to know. And, uh, John, I, I, I would, you know, I think it would be even uh, maybe a little easier uh, to to sort of a, you know to to get to that feeling, uh, that transmission, and uh, I have this experience of listening to Coltrane playing, you know, Love Supreme. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, you listen, he played this piece of music. You know, it's, it's totally, you know, it's a sound. And uh, he played, you know, through the notes of the music, you know, through his horn and uh, through his body. And uh, it's totally give me goosebumps and it's like what John said before you know uh you got this chill in your you know spine and that's the same kind of a uh, feeling I got when I stand in front of Colorado mountains and try to paint that thing you know it's uh, this the this this is like a undescribed you know this sensation and uh, how the artist and how the nature transmit, you know, this power and this energy and the, into the artist. 
and the, the our job is put down, you know, on the surface, and uh, you know, to pass that to whoever look at, and then you know, people, everybody see them see different things, sure. and uh, so that totally depends their own experience. I had this girl say to me, you know, he, he she last summer. Uh, I was painting at the Mount Grana. She looked for, for a few minutes, you know, it's so quite patient. And then she said, what are you painting? I said, what do you think I'm painting? She said, you're painting rainbow. Actually, I was painting this flower field with the cornfields behind and the, with the <laughs> whatever. Right. And it was, I was stunned to hear that, you know, actually, I thought, you know, I was too far off, or maybe, you know, that's something, you know, you aim higher, you know, that's what the John Coltrane does, you know, aim for a higher, you know, this higher power, you know, and the search for it. And then that's also what Ruth said, you know, the parallel life, you know, it's beautiful. Thank you. Next question. Next question. Here, come, here comes a big one. Jennifer says, I have an aversion to slick work, and I'm curious if this quality of ding ding sincerity is something you think about in your painting process, because although you all have very different way of speaking with paint, they all appear very sincere. Great question, Jennifer. I think um, when I was a younger painter, uh, you know, when I first started looking at paintings, I was so enamored by really slick painting. Like I like I went to a Sargent exhibition when I was in high school and I was just like, oh my gosh, like, boy, that guy could paint. Um, and then kind of later, I've, I've gotten much more interested in kind of these seeing these bits of the process and the struggle happening in a painting. Um, I think of like a Ewan Uglo painting where you see all the little measurement tick marks where he's like obsessively measuring something for hours and hours and hours. And I'm just like, falling in love with seeing that struggle, which seems really human and alive and vulnerable. Um, and um, I think I've become more interested in, in these paintings that kind of reveal themselves over time in a more complex uh, felt out way um, that are a little less, um, a little less slick and a little less, um, uh, you know, kind of virtuosic, yeah. Zoe, somebody mentioned about your paintings in particular. I think this is a great way to say it. Uh, if you could say something about the fracturing, I think of all the paintings that are here, there's a very obvious kind of fracturing. Do you uh, tell us about if that's conscious? I mean, obviously it's conscious, but what that means for you in the context of this kind of mark making, there's a lot of mark making and building up. Yours seems to have a very fractured uh, surface. Yeah, I think that that it's kind of, it's that play between abstraction and and representation. I think that I'm trying to struggle with and trying to figure out how to how to have both of those modes happen in a single painting. And I think maybe fracturing is one of the ways I've kind of explored that um, to kind of break up the the image so it's not just such a clean, clear, easy read. Um, kind of complicating it and putting other kind of layers of information into the image. So it's you know kind of one of the paintings was you know, inspired by, um, you know, uh, looking at a Piero della Francesca painting. And then I like put some of the bits of the robes of the figures from the original painting into my painting and just kind of, yeah, that's this one. Um, so there's like little bits of Piero in there. Um, so I think just trying to like get more into the images, like trying to get all of the things that I want to have happen in these um, kind of onto the surface. Um, can we put Zoe's uh, piece of her parents up there really quickly? Because I just wanted to comment on what, some of this because I think sometimes if you can go back to the one of her parents, that was you, there is one of your parents, right? Is this one, is that the one of your parents? Yeah. You're, right, so- You're muted, Zoe. Yeah, you're muted, Zoe. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is your parents, right? Yeah. Um. So, so, this to me, there's something very powerful about that. Like Zoe has no idea that this painting may ultimately make me have a dream tonight. But there was a reason inside of her that said, I need to paint my parents. 
with all the skill, with all the understanding that I have, with all the wisdom and knowledge. And that goes back to some of the questions that Ying Lin's questions, what about the geometry and things of this nature? So all I say is sometimes guys, the questions are not, is it good? The question is, what is my truth? And how can I get to my truth? And all to me, Zoe, and again, I do not want to speak out of turn. All to me, this painting speaks of is a person who wants to make a painting of her life, of people that she loves, onto the garment of all these things that we've talked about. But that leads us to this moment. Mm. Fractured, green, whatever. Oh, green. How did you... <laughs> so much of this painting is about you're being able to use that kind of what is it Veronese green or sev green or you know these different to use those in a way that i feel i'm it's mm -hmm. making me see it for the first time mm -hmm. you know and and these and the way i go and look at these charts you know <laughs> they're, they're 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 like a key to um something that's going on on a, on an abstract level within the painting as far as the color is concerned um yes look at that and see and see look at that to me i just want to say this mm. before it ends that is the beauty of people trying to express their truth because from a human being trying to say how they feel about their life offers somebody else a clue to their own experience yes that i that's beautiful. That's yeah. beautiful. I agree with that. I, I agree with all that everyone has said. It's a very powerful painting. Yeah. But it but it exists, you know, we we encounter her feeling about her parents. It's it's that's so meaningful, so deep. But the language that she's found is a damn good painting it's a really <laughs> yeah about i, I, I feel about that way. Painting. Yeah. i think and i think there is something about about wrong, having wrong painting oh well thank you all that i really appreciate those comments um i think there is something for me about having this kind of formal overlay like formal kind of question that i'm i'm thinking about as i'm entering into the painting that that kind of I don't know, makes it makes me able to see it in a in a fresh way, in a different way. Um, so those kind of grids and in this painting, I was using all of the greens I had in the studio and then cadmium orange to make this painting. Um, so just like setting up some little like struggle for myself um, can then kind of open up something unexpected, um, you know, in a, in a pretty everyday moment here. In, in before you were talking about the other painting, you were talking about uh, wanting to get more in the painting. Is the impetus for doing that similar to Ruth's wanting to push it further? Like, what is the further? What is the more? Like, or was it loving so many different set up things? Beforehand? What? <laughs> it's like loving too many different things. Like looking uh. at art, looking at art history, and wanting to have like. Piero and Velasquez and de Kooning all in a painting. Um, and how do I like get that all? How do I get like all of these different things that I love to kind of, how can I have like a little bit of all of them somehow? Zoe, Zoe, bless you. It can't be bad. Keep going that way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. I love that green rectangle, you know. How about me? Hey, get a load of me. Hey, hey, remember? <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can we look at Clintel, Clintel's work with the next question? I'd love to look at look at his paintings a little bit more. I just have absolutely love his yeah, work too. And I feel yeah. like he's been neglected here in our conversation. Oh, he shouldn't be. He's strong. <laughs> he's, yeah. he's a remarkable painter. Well, we may be able to throw a question toward Clintel. Yeah, here too. let's give him a question. Uh, yeah. There's some, some questions regarding is composition uh, symbolic as well, or does composition have meaning? Can tell this you'd be the perfect one to answer that sort of question. Do you, yeah, well, you I, I was, composition? I was going to say that uh, geometry is spiritual, um, and so I do think that there's a part of that force um, when you're working inside of that rectangle, trying to come up with that universe, that that language, that those forms, shape, color, all the things that we talk about to become the entity. And what is the entity? What are you left with? Right, and that's what the viewer, that's what you're giving the viewer. So 
I think sometimes when, when you arrive at sort of this understanding of geometry or it clicks in, you know, geometry is divine. That's why it exists. Um, and then I just also think everybody, which has also um, been talked about, is just living <laughs> um, in the now, uh, living in my moment. It's the same way as Van Gogh did, Monet did. All those people, you know, I, I, I'm a, uh, these are people that know me. I'm a big person about history. You know, that's what I love about the school. You know, Mercedes Matter. I mean, my God, she started the school for what? So we could have a conversation like this. Yes. Imagine that. Yes. That's so true. That's so true. You know what I'm saying? That you can yes. really break painting down and really think about it, really think about what it means, not on a superficial level. You know, but what you're really after, visually, understanding. All of us go to the museum. All of us go to the museum and study, visually study the masters, the ones who have paved the way. So uh, I'm very much honored, and uh, I think this is truth. Love you, Clintel. I love you, beautiful. I love you so much. Wow. Love you. Thank you. So I, I guess I'm curious, and Clintel, when you're doing those paintings, they they're so so spontaneous and loose feeling. And how, do you come with it with an idea in mind, or they evolve over time? Um, are you building things in there? Like how how are they built? I I, I, I was honestly thinking this, you know. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how you become an artist, how you become a painter, you know, the people you meet and all these things. And and, and for me, the, it, it's almost like Rufus saying, everybody said it, if you do, you know, one thing is born out of another. You never know, right? I'm just moving, reaching. Somebody says something to me, I've met beautiful people in my life, beautiful teachers that have affected me and that also I find to be very, you know, important in life to be affected by another human being, not with hate, but with love and to also raise my consciousness. So I think that, you know, it's in museums, you know, when I go to the museum, a lot of people, Eric, they don't understand, you know, when you go look at a Monet, it's not like you're just looking, but you're looking at surface, the way he was putting the paint down, the way it feels in front of your face. And yo, now, and for me, I've just had a lot of things happen in my now, and I'm just very grateful for you, Jordan. Thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you, Jordan. We all thank yes. you. Well, it's very this much. is a, just really you. This is a dream come true for me. It's you know, and it feels like you know this is. I'm I'm grateful for all of oh, there is an image. Okay, so um. Mm. You know that we are able to have this conversation i mean i've got you know what i could say about the problems of technology but this aspect of it and that we're able to have a real conversation together and we're all over the place that's just fantastic and uh you know it just feels like this is um this needed to happen and i and i and i sure hope we we can you know do it again and um uh, you know, it's just, just important. Um, we are, we are needing to wrap up. So, um, uh, I, I do have a few things just that I'd like to say, um, uh, as we wrap up, I mean, I, I want people to know that this, I believe has been recorded. So, um, uh, it will be posted, mm -hmm. um, uh, the New York Studio School will be posting it, and I, I will uh, also have uh, a, a, a copy or a link to it that will be available um, on, on my website. Uh, in the chat, there should be links to uh, all of our websites and uh, to the New York Studio School and the Sugarlift Gallery. Uh, and a few thoughts here. This conversation this caring about the relationship between meaning and making is not an extra thing. It's the essential thing. 
again, not in the conceptual sense, but in the felt embodied, fully human sense. It's why we paint and why painting matters today. It's conversation, oh, I said that, has been recorded. Uh, if anyone has any follow-up thoughts or questions, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you, all of you, uh, for, for joining us. Uh, thank you, all the panelists. Thank you, all the viewers. Thank you, New York Studio School and Sugarleaf Gallery. And any last thoughts that anyone would like to say? Did, any of you, did, it, did many of you go through a problem see, when you were uh, in art school, when people were telling you in, the, say, in the late 60s or the 70s, that if you choose to be a painter, you'll never be anything but a hopeless anachronism? Oh, yes. They didn't use There's a whole topic. There's a topic. <laughs> Thank okay. you, guys. They're still out there saying it. Well, as John well, Walker said, with me. I can tell, as John Walker said, I'm only intelligent when I'm drawing. Wow. Mm. Wow. wow. Here we are, talking, talking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. Be yeah, well. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. We'll be in Take touch. Care. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.